Cops usually don't get arrested unless it's a complete last resort. But some cops are so evil, there is no choice but to lock them up. From a cop arrested for speaking with minors... Jay, I'll be very honest, I just, I want to know the truth. No, I never even heard of that account. To a cop committing crimes that gave him 200 years in prison... And law enforcement, I'm three years on, but everything's about your rep. Absolutely. And I don't want this to fall on my rep. Here are the most corrupt cops ever to receive the badge. Starting with the case of a man who knew the law better than the corrupt cops who were trying to arrest him. I'm not giving you any ID. If you don't, you'll go to jail. The new Smyrna Beach Police Department launched an internal investigation into these three cops after they were accused of illegally detaining a man who appeared to be doing nothing wrong. They just don't want you up here anymore. Okay. They said you're asking for money and stuff like that. This hearsay. That's hearsay. I say I'm not asking for money. This is Army veteran Jeff. He was standing outside a local bar raising awareness for homeless veterans when the manager called the cops on him. He's being asked to leave, but it seems as though he knows his rights. However, this cop isn't happy when he starts to argue with him. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not causing anybody any trouble. If he doesn't like it, I'm on the public sidewalk. He doesn't have any authority over me. Okay, well, you can't be asking him for money and stuff like that. Even if I was asking people for money, it would still not be able to Okay, well, that's technically against the city ordinance. City ordinance is it's unconstitutional. All right, well, have a good night. Oh, well, I'm not done with you, so. You guys told? Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you going to ask him for money? Yeah. When, when I went out there, he was on our sidewalk. Is that okay if he just stays on the public sidewalk? And I'd rather he is than that, but he's not going to leave. This dude's being, uh, you know, yeah, he's holding the sign saying God bless America. This one identifying himself, saying he doesn't have the right to record me, stuff like that. In Florida, it's completely legal to record a cop doing their duty in a public place, as long as it's from a safe distance and doesn't obstruct the officer in any way. In fact, if if you're in a situation where you feel threatened by the police, it's advisable you begin to record for your own safety. Can you just move along for me? That's all they want you to do. I'm not moving along. Can I put in my heart to stand here and say this, and this is where I'm going to stand? Okay. I'm not answering any further questions. I've never been on their property or anything yeah, he, like that. He said you were on your property. On the property. Was not on their property. And he might be incorrect or misinformed about where his property line begins and ends. I've been standing right here the whole time. God bless I'll move along when I get finished doing what I'm doing. Jeff continues to stand his ground. That is, until more officers arrive on the scene and begin to escalate the situation. Okay, so you are on a public sidewalk. They're uh, saying that you are asking for money. They have every right to have you move along. And since we're here, because they called for you, we have to identify you. I'm not giving you any ID. If you don't, don't, you'll go to jail. Can I reach back my ID? It's... This is my ID. You, I mean, you want to play that game. I'm not showing you anything else. At this point, I'm invoking my right to remain silent. I'm invoking my right to have my attorney present during questions. Your attorney has nothing to do with us. Okay, your attorney has to do with court. That, that's not us. We have the right during an investigation to identify you. I'm not identifying myself. Okay, so you're going to end up going right. to jail. I told him my name is Jeff, and that's all I'm giving you. Am I being detained at this point? Yes. For what? For the, identifi for the identification of you, which is an investigation that they start. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not giving any identification. I would like to remain silent. Okay. At this point, you're being detained. Okay. So, you see this? Good. I don't consent to any searches. I don't consent to any seizures. Well, you're, you're, right now, I'm making sure you have no knives on you. You're breaking the law. What's this? There's two magazines in my left pocket. Okay. I want to make sure that you understand that you're forcing a hand that doesn't need to be forced. Uh, Have you guys been out here the whole time? Yeah, I've been, I've been in and out. Is he asking for money? Uh, I, he was he was uh, standing out here with the sign. I didn't hear him ask for money, no. Okay. So e Either way, my, my employee's uncomfortable with him standing out here. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll contact the sergeant, but if he's out here, there's not much we can do about that, especially since if he's not begging for money. Man. So even though my employee's uncomfortable and now I know he's armed, that's okay. Which he's legally allowed to be. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <It doesn't, laughs> a lot of people are legally allowed to be that shouldn't be, apparently. So, to put it simply, Jeff hadn't broken any laws whatsoever. He was standing on public property, raising awareness for something completely protected by free speech. And any issues the employees had with that were their problem. I just asked the, the guy who's sitting on the porch, and he says he didn't hear you beg for money. And so, the only person who has a complaint has a complaint about you standing on city property, which is not his problem, which is what I was explaining to him. Jeff was allowed to leave and this should have been where the story ended. But there's one thing we haven't mentioned. At the time of this stop, 
panhandling or asking strangers for money was not illegal in the state of Florida. This means that not only was Jeff harassed and falsely arrested for a crime he didn't commit, but it wasn't even a crime in the first place. These cops have a lot to explain, and things only got worse. At approximately 1927 hours on Tuesday, December 14th, 2021, were you dispatched to a call for service identified as a suspicious person at the New Smyrna Brewery located at 143 Canal Street? Yes. What did they tell you? Um, the call notes started out saying that there was a male dressed in all black. Originally, he was asking for money from people that sat in there, and that's all I read because I was right around the corner from the scene. So what crime were you intending to investigate there? Well, at that point, they said that he was um, at or in the business, and the business owner just wanted him to be moved along. Do they call that panhandling or asking for money is yes. what is said in the yes. call notes? Yes. Is is panhandling a crime or a city ordinance violation? It's not a city ordinance violation. Why did you tell Mr. Gray that asking for money is technically against city ordinance? At that point, I thought panhandling was a city ordinance violation. What's the state statute refer to? Uh, like if you're blocking, like stepping out in traffic, okay. uh, blocking people's right of, right to move. So it's a it's a 316 violation for some type of impediment of traffic. Right. If it's you're a traffic violation. Soliciting or entering a traffic patterns, right. right? That wasn't the case here, was it? No. Okay. A 316 violation in this case includes any situation where a pedestrian walks on a road where there is a sidewalk provided. This relates to panhandling as many people like to stand near intersections and approach cars that can't move away due to traffic. But as Jeff was on the sidewalk, he wasn't guilty of obstructing any traffic. That's the first problem revealed. But things get even worse when this officer is asked if there was even a crime committed at all. Did you have any reasonable or articulable suspicion that Mr. Gray committed, was committing, or was about to commit a crime or a violation of city ordinance? At that point, I believed he might have, um, so that's why I went back out and re-engaged with him. I thought we had something maybe okay. stirring up. So at this point, you're, you're still thinking panhandling is a, is a city ordinance uh, yes. violation, yes. and you're acting on that assumption yes. to try to continue the investigation? Yes. Okay. Usually, like when we investigate other crimes and stuff like that, we listen to both sides of the stories, come back, talk to each other. I don't know where that happened, maybe because he was flustered with him. Do you think that would have been a more prudent course of action to, to continue the investigation and figure out I what's do. going on? I do, yes. Rightly, this officer is starting to sense that he might be in a spot of trouble. But instead of taking this on the chin, he instead starts to pin some of the blame on his partner. Did you hear Officer Beatty tell uh, Mr. Gray that if he didn't identify himself, he was going to go to jail? I did, yes. Okay. I definitely think that when he got there that the course of action he took probably was not the best one. And uh, I kind of wish that we would have went back and had him talk to the business owner um, and then have him talk to, talk to me. I think that we skipped over that step and he went straight to going hands on with him. Taking a look at Officer Beatty's investigation tape, it seems that both of the officers have realized their mistakes, but still claim that they were right to place Jeff in handcuffs at the time, even suggesting that he was baiting them into it. During the call, I was under the impression that he was actually on the property and trespassed, that he was asked to leave, and that his waitresses were scared. Looking back hindsight, you know, I could have investigated further. He was baiting. The, the, no question. No question of that. This guy was probably, in my opinion, doing stuff that would elicit the very call that came into the, to, to dispatch that he wanted in order to create the confusion. A good cop who knows the law and knows how to exercise it shouldn't even be able to be baited in the first place. It's concerning that a man simply standing on public property, spreading awareness for a good cause, can be mistreated by police officers and told he's at fault for their mistake. Luckily, there are good cops out there, and the final officer involved in the investigation got straight to the point when asked to describe his point of view. Um, I asked Beatty why he was detained, uh, and he told me that he was detained because he was refusing to identify himself and I said well for what crime are you investigating and he said that he was investigating and panhandling and I, he said it's against city ordinance and I said I told him no it's not against city ordinance uh, and he said well it's against state statute as well and I said it's, it's not against state statute I told him I said that it, from what you're telling me it sounds like you had no legal authority to seize the gentleman or his uh, firearm if you don't have a crime 
to investigate, you can't seize the person. It's unknown what happened to these cops after the investigation, but we can only hope that they received the same treatment as the cops in Patrick Mumford's case. Patrick was just getting back home when two officers confronted him, claiming there were warrants out for his arrest. What the cops didn't realize, though, is that the warrants were for a completely different man, but this didn't seem to bother them. What, what's your name? I'm going to ask you one more time. We, need, well, we probably need to talk to you. Morning, so, Let me imagine what's your name? Patrick? Stand up. Patrick is justifiably nervous here after suddenly being confronted by multiple police officers, but still manages to give the cops his name. However, they decide that they don't believe him, and instead of asking for an ID or trying to confirm his identity in any way, they immediately decide to do this instead. He just came back from his probation officer. Back from his probation officer. I got, I got Taser. Right, Taser. You coming out? Taser. You coming out? Taser. Taser. Come out. Get your hands out now. You, you got three seconds. Hold on, man. Three seconds. Do not up. reach. Get up. Put your hands on the car. Right. Show me the one. Come out. Two. Right, Taser. Right, Taser. Move. Get off. Get off. move. 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 You coming out or not? Come out. You got a warrant. You better get out of the car. Get out of the car. Get out of the car! Get out of the car! Man, leave me alone, cousin. Right, move, Fox, move! It took just 38 seconds from the police making first contact to giving the order to tase him. According to the cops, Patrick was given numerous reasonable opportunities to comply with officers, but because of his resistance, they were left with no choice but to stun him. But even after being tased and detained, the cops still aren't finished roughing Patrick up. Something was going on, man. Just off me, man. He keeps reaching for his back. Ah! Quit resisting. I got him, guys. Just get, get search whatever he's going for. The cops search Patrick to try and find whatever he was reaching for, assuming he was hiding a weapon of his own. But predictably, they find nothing other than his wallet. This would end up being a blessing for Patrick, though, as inside his wallet, the cops found his ID. I just seen this fucking lady. Oh, Patrick Mumford. That lady not gonna tell me that. I got a warrant. I just seen her. Here's the deal, dude. How long I had a warrant? I don't know if you got a warrant, because you're not who I'm looking for. But here's the deal. When we ask you for ID, because you look a lot like the person we're looking uh, for, you give us ID. And when you start this whole fight nonsense, dude, all you had to do is give me this. But the way you came up, asked me out of nowhere. Remember, the cops never once asked for Patrick's ID during the initial interaction. In a later report, the cops also stated that they were worried he was reaching for a weapon when he was shuffling back in the car. So, do you think they would have been okay with him reaching into his back pocket for his wallet? He wasn't given any chance to correctly identify himself, but now the cop is patronizing him and saying he caught a case he didn't need to get. And above all, he's still being manhandled and forced onto the hood of their patrol. Patrol vehicle. What's the, what's the guy's name? Is there someone here to stay here that looks like you? Think about it. Hey, Jack. Yeah. Guess what he's looking for? Tell him. Who, who does he look a lot like? I don't know. He knows who it is. So who is it? Michael? He is not Michael. With, okay, I know that now. Well, they thought it, it was my son? Yes! Really? They don't even look nothing like that. And then besides that, well, he needs to have a week out. They look exactly. Oh, wow. Well, I'm looking at that picture. I mean, Don't they look not more off. Okay, are we wrong? For the record, this is the man they're looking for. It's difficult to draw even a single similarity in appearance, but the cops apparently saw so many that they were comfortable with discharging a weapon at Patrick. Patrick was initially charged with obstruction and violating probation, and was fixed to lose his job and position at college. Thankfully though, an internal investigation was launched into the four officers on the scene, and it was concluded that they didn't follow proper procedure. All four of the officers were suspended, and Patrick was awarded 
with a settlement of $100,000. Being arrested because of mistaken identity is harrowing enough, but being arrested because of the color of your skin must be terrifying, especially when a cop wants to play games. On July 15th, 2018, Montre and his friend were pulled over by the police. The stop started out normal, but quickly evolved into a perfect display of how cops will try to force you into a false confession through corruption and, in this case, racism. What's going on, guys? Not much. Nice. Is this your car? Well, it's a rental right now. My car's been shot. Okay. Did you, something break down? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you guys just came from over the park, right? Yeah, we're just hanging out. That's it? Is this your car? I just told you my car's in the shop, officer. This is a rental. Okay. How do you start it? What do you mean? I just put my foot on the brake and I put it in drive and I... Okay. At first, this may seem like a harmless question, but asking the driver, Montre Little, how to start the car essentially implies that the cop thinks he stole it. If Montre was unfamiliar with the vehicle, he would have likely struggled to remember how to start it. And if he fumbled around a little before remembering, it could imply he was under the influence. But Montre kept his composure and passes this first test totally fine. The cop, however, still isn't impressed and decides to take things further by tricking Montre into giving his property over. So it's your car, though? Did they give you a it's fob or something? My car, officer. Did my they car give you a key fob or something? Or? Yes, sir. Officer. Like, what does it do? Does it? You see, this, this, lets, this actually lets you know that it's in. Okay. Do you have any weapons on you or in the car? No, officer. Okay, can I be honest with you? It smells like marijuana in the car, and I can see shake on the ground. Yeah. Your buddy's given me the idea that maybe he's got a gun. I'm, I'm, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I think. How? I don't know. Just the, the way, I mean, just the way you're holding yourself, man. Like, that's why I'm, that's why we're nervous, man. That's it. Not only did the officer mislead Montre into giving the keys over, but he's also suddenly decided he can smell marijuana in the vehicle and based purely on a hunch that the passenger is hiding a weapon. Both of these things, especially the marijuana smell, are often used as a reason to search the vehicle, bypassing the need for consent by the property owner. The speed and order in which the officer works here is extremely suspicious. Confiscating the keys without even mentioning it implies that he already decided he was going to search the vehicle and that he was trying to make Montre feel helpless or even threatened. Emotions you can clearly see on his face as they're stolen from him. Go ahead and step out, Montre. Yep, I just told you why. Three times. You want me to recap again? Right. I mean, I, I, I told you I'm a cop. Face the car when you step out. Face the car when you step out. Face the car when you step out. Don't flex. Don't flex. I don't know what you're doing, man, but you need to knock that off. Stop pulling on your arms. What's going on, dude? Where are you trying to go? What are you doing, dude? Officer, I'm not doing nothing to you. Well, you're making me think something funny is going on, man. Okay, so slide over here. I mean, your heart is thumping, dude. Like, you're beating. Officer, don't. No, Everything the cop has done and said so far is textbook in terms of corruption. This is obviously a serious event for Montre, but the cop is deliberately trying to be lighthearted and jovial about the whole thing, using words such as funny and silly to purposefully seem condescending. He also mentions that Montre's heart is beating fast and that he seems nervous. Another classic observation that appears time and time again in these cases. Think back to the stop of Marion Humphrey, whose truck was searched for the sole reason that he seemed nervous. Innocent civilians such as Montre will always feel anxious or even angry in this situation, and it's an easy observation for cops to make to detain them and obtain probable cause, which is exactly what the cop did. The search uncovered nothing illegal in Montre's car, but the cop kept him in the back of his patrol vehicle. This is where things start to get really shady. I did everything you asked me to, officer. You thought there was a weapon? There's no weapon. We wasn't doing anything wrong, officer. I'm not sure why you pulled me over. That's your rental. Everything is fine. There is no breaking taillight or nothing, officer. I did nothing wrong with you. Did I make anything up when I said the car smelled like marijuana? Yeah, a little bit. A little hold bit. On, hold on, hold on, hold because on. Because there is nobody there smoking in the is car. Is there marijuana shake on the floor of the car? Officer, that was cigarette ash, okay? There's no, you didn't find no marijuana. I did, I'm not charging you with marijuana. I, but here's here's what, if, if you want me to, if you want me to be real with you, like, I want you to be real with me for a second. Like, did I make that up? I believe so, officer. Okay, so you want me to just write you the ticket for the stuff that I have to write you tickets for? 
Uh-huh. If you think that I'm lying, like, then we'll go to court and we'll, we'll talk about it then. Okay. Or do you want to just be real with me and I'll be real with you? Wow. Awesome. Montre is being aggressively backed into a corner. The cop obviously knows that he's done something wrong. He's only trying to get Montre to forget about it and move past it without further incident. When he doesn't, the cop threatens him by saying he'll write up the ticket and he'll have to take it to court where it'll essentially be Montre versus the world. It's also important to remember that cops are allowed to lie and use deceptive tactics to extract a confession. If Montre had told him that he didn't make up the smell, then in a weird, twisted way, he essentially just admitted to possessing illegal drugs. Luckily, Montre maintained his story and was reluctantly let go by the cops. Just days later, Montre sued the city and after a year of fighting, reached a settlement of $75,000 based on an unlawful traffic stop and warrantless search. The cop was removed from patrol duty, but not fired, despite leading one of the most callous displays of corruption ever caught on camera. But the police are extremely good at one-upping themselves when it comes to corruption. Take for example the time when two Californian cops essentially kidnapped a man eating lunch in his own car. What's going on? You live around here? Hey, don't touch, don't touch, don't relax, touch, bro. Relax, hey, hey, you match the description of somebody, okay, that just committed a burglary in the area. Okay, you're on camera, so can, don't can, worry. Step out is, the car. Is your, is, your, is, your, is your body cam on? It's on, yes, it's, it's on. on. What, what's, step on out, dude. We'll explain everything to you, okay? Just step out of the car. Step no, out of no, the car. No, no, I'm not stepping out of the car. You're being detained for a burglary investigation, okay, sir? So step no, no, out. No, 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 no. Do you live in the area? I'm not answering questions. I want my lawyer. Okay, okay. step out of the car. You're being detained right now. Alright, sit by the car. Firstly, the suspect named Jamal Williams does everything right. He tells the cops he's not answering any questions until he has a lawyer. Unfortunately for him though, the cops aren't having any of it because he matches the description of a suspect that technically gives them the right to detain him while they investigate further. What's interesting is that the only description the cops had was that it was a black male wearing all black in his early 20s possibly a red t-shirt underneath. Jamal is 40 years old, wearing a red hoodie and gray sweatpants. It's also incredibly hard to punish cops for detaining someone that doesn't match that description, as they could just say they thought he did. In general, the system is very lackluster, but it shouldn't necessarily harm or bother Jamal. Not unless the cops do this. Sir, step on out, dude. You're, Sir. you're on camera, dude, so don't do anything dumb, okay? Step Hold on, on I'm, I'm gonna get this okay. on camera. All right. Go ahead, Look. you can record. Step out of the car, please. He's being aggressive. Hey, you, you, hey, stop hey, resisting, you, you, dude. Stop resisting. I'm just. Well, why, why are you. Why, no, man. Okay. Get out of the car. Call your supervisor. 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 Stop, dude. Call your supervisor. I'm gonna chase you, dude. Call your supervisor. Yeah, I'm calling your supervisor. I got Give me your hand. Don't give you consent to touch me. Don't reach. I don't give you consent to touch me. Don't reach. I don't give you consent. Handcuff. Initially, Jamal showed no signs of aggression and no signs of resisting. He was just trying to open his phone to record the interaction for his own safety. Nevertheless, the cop immediately said he's being aggressive as Jamal was willingly stepping out of the car. Step out of the car, please. He's being aggressive. This obviously frustrated Jamal, and he later admitted from then he did try and stay inside the vehicle. But the amount of force the cops used from here on was completely unwarranted. One cop even pulled a taser and threatened to use it on Jamal, despite him posing no actual threat. Jamal is then handcuffed and kept face down on the tarmac while multiple other patrol vehicles arrive at the scene. For a man guilty of nothing other than eating his lunch, that sure is a lot of cops. If we take these off, are you going to cause a problem? Are you going to kick any windows out, anything like that? I don't want to answer questions. You can leave them on, then. That's fine. That's fine. Right. Which way do you want to put them? up and get them to a car. Just leave them here until fire season them real quick to make it easy. He doesn't, he doesn't want to walk, but he doesn't want to answer questions. And he's leaving them. All right. Is your first name Jamal? That's who the car is. I don't give you consent to go on my car and check my car. I don't give you consent to check my car. You're violating my Fourth Amendment constitutional right. 
So I think we, should, we can move forward and try at least get her in the back seat. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what's your name again? Now why are you guys kidnapped? I can't talk to you until you help me out. Tell me why am I being kidnapped? Well, same with you, we'll figure that out. I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, Find a car and put it in there. We'll talk when you get to the at this point, there are over a dozen cops at the scene, and Jamal is fully restrained in both handcuffs and leg wraps. He's also already been cleared to not be the suspect, yet he's still taken to the patrol car, fully restrained, and put in the back seat. It's also important to note that the cops were able to identify and clear Jamal by running his plates, something they could have done in secret before even approaching him. The worst part is that even after all of this, Jamal still wasn't free. He was cleared of the burglary charge, but he was instead hit with a felony charge of resisting arrest and taken to jail. Jamal later filed a formal complaint with the LA Sheriff's Department. But just as another example of how corrupt this system is, they were allowed to investigate themselves. And as you'd expect, they found no evidence of any wrongdoing. Months later, Jamal filed a civil rights lawsuit against the arresting officers. Unfortunately though, the story remains much the same. The officers were investigated by a police lieutenant and after analyzing the body cam footage, it was concluded that Jamal's actions turned the interaction confrontational and that the arresting officers were courteous throughout the entire event. Jamal's charges were dropped, but no charges were brought against either of the cops. Violence is one thing, but that's not the only way that corrupt cops can screw you over. These two cops were a perfect example of another creative method they often use, planting evidence. It's a little bit of weed. On the 13th of March, 2018, Officer Kyle Erickson and his partner pulled over Jason Serrano and his friend for an apparent broken taillight. However, this stop ended up getting seriously out of hand when a cop tried to plant evidence. The car smells like marijuana, so we're going to check it, all right? Okay, and then what? Then that's it. Then I got to make sure everything's good with your end. Just get the taillight fixed. If there's nothing in the car, you'll be good to go. All right. Immediately, the cops claim they can smell marijuana in the car and say that they're going to have to search it. Usually, a civilian has the right to refuse a search, but if the cops have probable cause to believe a suspect has committed a crime, they can bypass that right and search their property without consent. Smelling weed on the property technically counts as probable cause, and because it's impossible to dispute while looking at body cam footage, it's often used as a way for corrupt cops to easily begin a search without the suspect's permission or a warrant. We need to check the car, so I need you to hop out. All right, I'm getting up. Okay. Relax. Hang on with me. I don't have nothing in my jacket. I'm not. Okay. Well, he's gonna check it. I don't have nothing no, in my no, no, relax. No, I don't need to. This situation is about to escalate for no reason. No, because I don't. No, I didn't do nothing. It was in the car. No, this is yeah, on me. Relax. It's my possession. Come on. Relax. Relax! Relax! Put that jacket down right now. Put the jacket down! Cuff him up. For the rest of the body cam footage, Jason is left on the ground handcuffed and visibly in pain from the takedown. It took almost 20 minutes for an ambulance to arrive. It's unclear on the body cam footage, but with how much pain Jason is in, it's obvious that an unnecessary amount of force was used to take him down. So for the cops, this is just where the story begins, and you can see the exact moment reality sets in for them. All right, I'm searching the rest of the car. Actually, I'll let you check. Yeah, there's that flashlight. I'll stay with him. Yeah. The officers are fully aware that they've hurt Jason, and if their car turns up empty, all they've done is searched a car without a warrant and used excessive force to unlawfully detain a civilian. However, if they do find something illegal, then all of that should magically go away, as Jason and the driver go from civilians to criminals, and they're just helping bring them to justice. At this point, it's not necessarily just about race. They're trying to save themselves after making a violent mistake. Obviously, this is horribly corrupt, but nevertheless, the stakes are high for the cops. They're jobs are on the line and they have to find something. Uh, no, she has a proper documentation for the plates. Temporary registration is valid. Uh, just ran her permit only. Uh, he doesn't have a driver's license. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Did you see him? My partner found anything yet? Oh. see nothing. Nothing. After searching the entire vehicle for about five minutes, the cops turn up nothing, and they both start to seem more and more agitated. 
But here's where things start to take a dark and shady turn. When the officers fail to turn up anything, they decide to get a little creative. I see nothing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's a little bit of weed. Without even trying to hide it from his camera, the detective places a small bud of marijuana in the cup holder of the vehicle, where he's already checked multiple times. The way the officer does this without even trying to hide it implies that he's almost certain that this will never come back to haunt them, and even suggests that this might not be his first time doing it either. In fact, the way the cops have been talking to each other the entire time indicates that this might just be a regular step in their process. You good? You good? Yeah. All of a sudden, the cops have a case against Jason. During the stop, they smelled marijuana in the car. Jason became combative after they asked to search it, so they took him down and searched the car, where they found not only a small piece in the cup holder, but even flakes in his jacket. This is the story that Jason was taken to trial over, and he was charged with marijuana possession, resisting arrest, and obstructing governmental administration. It took over two years for this body cam footage to emerge, and only then would Jason's charges be dropped. Predictably, no charges were brought against the officers, but it did raise an important question. What else has been caught on these cameras that's being hidden from us? It's incredible how many cops completely forget that they're on camera 24-7, just like these cops did when they got caught in the act by their own dash cam. I'm on the side of the road, legally parked, with a sign which is protected by the First Amendment. When officers see a man holding up a sign on the side of the road in March of 2022, they decide to pull over and check it out. The man named Jonathan was warning drivers of the speed trap that they were about to drive past. These two officers took offense big time. Well, want to nothing. Go somewhere else you guys I'm going to do it right here where you're I'm not, at. Not, so I'm not. I have drivers coming up to me telling me that you're jumping out in traffic. Because apparently they're erroneous. I don't give a what somebody else says. What did you witness? Okay. Nothing of the sort. So keep your to yourself, pal. Traffic fines make up a percentage of police department's budget, and these Delaware cops didn't want Jonathan to stand in their way of that crucial source of income. But Jonathan isn't accepting their claims that he's been walking into the road and stands his ground. You keep saying jumping in traffic. When did you witness this offense? Don't you came to me. You came to me. You came to me. You came to me. Just to tell me that you're just out front of with the sign. So they want to lick your boots, let them. Don't put your hands on me. But what one officer does next may have completely violated this citizen's right to express himself. Don't put your hands on me. Do not give me my property back. You piece of Give me my property back. You see this? You tyrant piece of sh What are your badge numbers? Step back, okay? No, Don't walk up no, you like stole that. my property. Did you see anything in my hands? You I stole piece your property. Of Have a nice day. Jonathan goes on to tell the officers that he's going to be right back here with a new sign as soon as he can. As he drives away, he makes an insulting hand gesture towards the cops, and of course, they pull him over for it. What happens over the course of this traffic stop is not just dumb, it's downright corrupt. You're stopping me for constitutionally protected speech, right? Because you had your finger, your hand out the, the window. This is what I did. You got a problem sorry, with that? Sorry, that? Listen to me. Listen to me. No, sorry. no, no. All right, listen. Go That's away. That is disorderly conduct. No, it is not. That is disorderly conduct. That is called freedom of speech. If you are no, out in no, the public, no, 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 you are no, out no, in the public no, and people no, see you. No, it is not. Here's, here's, here's what's going to happen. No. License, please. No. Here's what's going to happen. I want your supervisor, please. Okay. I am the supervisor. I am the supervisor. License, and that's please. why I'm here. Both officers seem to be stumbling over exactly what they have pulled them over for, and it's honestly starting to look embarrassing at this point. And I'm going to take you to court. Oh, here's what I'm saying. Take it to court. That's what I want you to do. That's license, what I want. You. I want you to take it to court. So, so let, but before we go license. any farther, you're pulling me over for what? Because for you had your conduct. You had your finger. This out only conduct. Now, what? Here's what's about to happen. You're about to be arrested again for resisting arrest. No, I'm not resisting yes, anything. Well, yeah, yeah. Right no. now, you're right now you're you're being detained. For okay? what? You're being detained. I told you for, why I stopped you already, sir. For putting my middle finger up. That's yeah, correct. No, correct. No, exactly. For, correct. Right. You extended correct. your arm out the window. No, no I have my yes, middle finger did. out the window. Okay, so, let's get your. Let me get your ID. Okay, you had your middle finger out the window. It appears the officers are trying to arrest him on any charges they can, and when that doesn't work, 
they resort to dirty tricks. The next thing you do, we're going to take you in, we're going to tow the car, and we'll call, call per, uh, social services for the kid. Oh, so now you're, threatening, now you're threatening I'm my child. No, he's not no, he's a threat, it's a happen. promise. You're threatening my child now. I'm telling you what's going to happen. You heard the officer right. He's just threatened to get social services involved and have Jonathan's child taken away from him. But what makes this case even more shocking is the fact that these two cops plan to lock him up, whatever it took, and it was all recorded on their own dash cam. I I'm telling you, if you put your arm out the road, your hand out the road, and you, you like, with a middle finger, you could, that's like a, isn't that? I'm, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you yeah. sure about that? Middle finger. Okay. As you drive by, like, oh, game on. I mean, he pulled him over for, like, giving him the middle finger. Yeah, give, give him the, yeah, for giving him the middle finger. So, yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. That'll get dropped. Yeah, that's going to get dropped. I told him his death's going to get thrown out. But it, it's just going, you know, it's going to cause the problem. Even after they're told by their supervisor that the charges will be thrown out, they still have a grand plan to put Jonathan in handcuffs. Right, right. Yeah, something like that that'll fly. Unfortunately, I mean, yeah. you, you can't, we, we can't pull people over. We can't write a ticket for going to fuck off or right. giving us the middle finger and stuff like that and, yeah you know that's that's their right to do so yeah um yeah. but all right i'll do some more work up on this guy and uh i'll uh i'll pass it on and then number two yeah he you know we have no real basis yeah so it, it, he's, right. in, he's gonna do something stupid one day where we are gonna be able to lock him up for disorderly conduct or yeah. and, and, and i just wish we had the witness and and even had it on video in the end Jonathan filed a lawsuit against the officers, saying they violated his constitutional rights by preventing him from warning motorists about a speed trap. In September 2023, he won the case and was awarded a $50,000 settlement sum. This next cop appeared to be the model officer. That was until detectives uncovered his chilling secret. This is Grant Hardin, a 50-year-old police officer hiding a horrifying secret. Grant has been apprehended on suspicion of murder, but as it would later transpire, his his crimes and behavior were so bad that in his interrogation, he tried everything he possibly could to escape. On the 23rd of February, James Appleton had pulled into a parking lot on Ganridge Road to take a phone call with his brother-in-law. Suddenly, a loud banging sound was heard over the phone, and the line went dead. A passerby had spotted a white Chevrolet Malibu parked behind James's car that immediately sped away after the loud noise. When the passerby went to check on James, he was lying dead at the wheel with a gunshot wound to the head. Gateway, Arkansas is a small town of 400 people, so the owner of the Chevy was quickly determined to be Grant Hardin, a 50-year-old police officer who had lived in this town his whole life. Later that night, Grant's vehicle was stopped at a police roadblock after taking his family out for dinner, and he was quickly brought in for questioning. But unfortunately for everyone involved, Grant's experience in law enforcement would prove to make this interrogation one of the most excruciating and difficult that Arkansas police had ever had to deal with. I'm just like Chamberlain. I know we have many Jennings, Chamberlain. Okay. Uh, I, I, did you used to be a police officer yeah. somewhere? Or, I, I recognized you, but I wasn't 100% sure where I knew you from. But somebody said that you used to be a police officer at Gateway or something like that. Okay. The interrogation begins casually as Detective Chamberlain opens with questions about Grant's career. As they're both police officers, he assumes he can strike an immediate middle ground with him, building trust between them and hopefully getting him to relax so he'd give up information easier. A strategy that he'd soon find out had the opposite effect. Grant is then read his rights, but decides this is where he's going to start making it difficult for the detectives. Here's the thing, I want to talk to you about what, what you've done today, okay? Can you just take me through when you woke up this morning to when you got stopped by the police out there in, what's the name of that road you're on? I'm sorry, I'm gonna drop Gant Ridge. I'm not gonna say anything after I've been read those rights yet. Okay. Well, I don't know what's going on. I am kind of sickly <laughs> to, uh, to what I'm here for and things. Up until this point, Grant hasn't been told what he's been brought in for, and states that he's feeling sickly given the circumstances he's been put into. Given his disturbing body language, he may also be feeling exposed and somewhat inferior due to being the suspect of a case instead of the detective for the first time in his life. So you don't want to explain what you've done today? Did you? Um, is there a reason behind that? What was the first thing said? I have the right to remain silent. Okay. So you're telling me that you don't want to talk to me right now? 
Okay, cool. Hang tight right here for just a few minutes, okay? As is normal in a case like this, the detectives leave the room for a few minutes to talk about how they're going to handle the interview. And not only does it give them time to formulate their approach, but it also gives the suspects time alone to worry about what could be going on and form anxiety regarding their situation. At the same time, though, it may also give the suspect a moment to collect their thoughts and generate their own story and approach to the interview, putting the detectives on the back foot instead. Okay, so I, I don't know if I scared you at the beginning or, or what, but that's why I was trying to, and I can't, you see you see the position that I'm in, I can't tell you why you're here, but at the same time, I, I need to rule you out into something. Does that, does that make sense? When the detectives re-enter the room, they try an obviously different approach, this time attempting to set Grant at ease, stating that they just need to clear him from any wrongdoing and then he's free to go on his way. Many people would, at least subconsciously, be inclined to open up a little more in an attempt to get out of there as soon as possible. But Grant has other ideas. Would you be willing to talk to me about your day knowing that I need to rule you out of something? Or like, I, I, I'm just, if you didn't do anything wrong today, you have nothing to worry about. Yes, I, I would have liked to, but before, yeah. The rights were read, so okay. not knowing what's going on. Yeah, and you understand as a detective, we have we read those rights to everybody who comes in here. It's not just you. It, it happens to everybody that walks through this room and talks to us. As a former police officer, Grant is fully aware of all of this. He knows everybody that's interviewed, innocent or not, has to be read these rights, which essentially completely invalidates this as the real reason that he isn't talking. He's just using it as an excuse to refuse to talk and possibly to even stall for time. I guess my question is this, knowing what I just told you, I guess if it was me and I was, you know, if I was in your position, I'd be like, hey, James, I did this, I was at, or Grant, I did this, I was at, you know, here, 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 and here, and I would just be done with it. But at this point, like, I can't clear you from this because you could still be, potentially be a suspect. I don't know if I'm not explaining it right or what is yes, going on here. I'm it fine. I just okay. have to, once the, once the rights have been read, I have to, uh, it says I have the right to be silent. Yes. Okay. Just tell me this. I know you were a police officer before, right? You're, you're a police officer in, in Gateway? It's an easy yes or no. I, I'm being silent. Well, I can see that. We can do this all night. I mean, it doesn't bother me. You're going to continue to be a suspect until I find out otherwise. Okay. Unfortunately for the detectives, Grant is exercising perfect form within this interrogation. Refusing to talk greatly hinders the investigation as a whole and completely prevents the detectives from making progress, all while being completely legal. This is why Detective Chamberlain is starting to appear visibly annoyed and decides to take a break from the interrogation, as letting emotions take control in an investigation like this can be extremely dangerous for the detectives. But once again, this time alone can also give the suspects the chance to come up with a plan. Hello, I need to go. You need to go where? Home or get ready for work in a little bit. Okay, we'll just have a seat and I'll get, I'll get it for you. Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Hey, Grant. Yes, sir. No, you're awesome. You want to talk to me again? What's going on? I'm just ready to go. Okay. And I'm not I'm not ready for you to go yet, so you're not gonna be able to go. I've got other things that I'm doing right now, so Well I I just wanna I was gonna go. Oh no, okay. you're not gonna go. Tell you that. Okay, yeah, no you're not gonna go. But I'm going to Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Oddly enough, in many other investigations like this, now is around the time where an officer may attempt to come to a decision regarding the suspect. The interview is obviously at a complete standstill and no progress is being made in any direction. The standard protocol would be to either gather the information needed to charge the suspect for a crime or release them based on a lack of evidence. But whether the detective thinks he can extract more information or if it was an ego-based decision, Grant is told to stay and continue the interrogation. The police then try to take some time to piece together more of the story, talking to witnesses to try and place Grant at the scene of the crime. Despite his silence being perfectly legal and acceptable, 
it greatly increases the detective's suspicion towards him. Suspicion that's only heightened when Grant's wife says that his only alibi was that she thought he was spreading grass seeds at the time of James's death. All signs point towards Grant, and Detective Chamberlain goes back in for round three. Uh, Detective Cordero is talking to your wife right now. I talked to her a little bit. So I've kind of got a timeline of where you were and where you weren't today. Um, we all know what happened, okay? I'm not trying to get you in any trouble. I'm not trying to get her in any trouble. You've got a little daughter, 16, who needs her parents, okay? I don't know if you've had a problem with this guy for a while, or, and this was an accident, or you maliciously chasing down, or, or what happened. But if I don't get your side of the story, I won't ever know. We're writing a book. You got chapter one, you got chapter two and chapter three. Chapter one is what happened today, what started out today, how your day started. Chapter two is what led up to the incident. And chapter three is you telling me about what happened to lead you up to that. I know you went to eat uh, you know, out tonight. I know what you said at dinner. I know that you went to Lowe's afterwards. I, kn I know everything, but I don't know what caused the incident. And if I don't know that, I I've got to assume the worst. I'll let you think about it. I'm, I, I'll give you one more chance here in a few minutes, and I'm not, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. I'm not telling you that. Well, what happened? I know, you know. We have witnesses that put you there. They physically ID'd you. The two cars that drove by. Look, man, I'm not... I, I just want to know why it happened. I, I'm going to sleep good tonight regardless. I don't think you will. At the time of the murder, when the two cars were parked up beside each other, the man in the white Chevrolet waved the passerby past before the gun was fired. As they passed, they were able to get a good look at the driver. And unfortunately for Grant, it was Andrew Tillman, another resident of the small town who had known him since he was a child, and was hence able to undoubtedly place him at the scene of the crime as the gun went off. Both Grant and Chamberlain know without a doubt what happened to James, but Grant also knows that his only chance of escaping is to continue to remain silent and pray that they can't gather the evidence they need. The detectives are now forced to try almost anything they can think of to get movement out of Grant, starting with allowing him to see his wife and daughter in hopes that it will invoke some sort of emotional reaction within him and get him to talk. Your wife's about to leave. She wanted to give you a hug before she left. Are you good with that? Unfortunately, even this doesn't work. So instead, Detective Cordiero decides to return alone with a more calm and sympathetic demeanor in a second attempt to build trust with Grant. Often, male suspects are more likely to build a subconscious connection with female detectives due to them often thinking that they're less threatening and more understanding. Realistically, this is the last option the detectives have. All right, get ready to they might lay down up on that desk, but it looks awful hard. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be any more comfortable up there than what you are now. Can you help me understand how we got to this point? I don't know. You don't know? Man, I remember being on patrol and running into you one night. Help me out on a call. Back me up. Oh. It was way back in, uh, I guess almost three years now. Well, yeah, I thought we saw that. Yeah, something like that. You guys were always good to help us, help help me too. Yeah, man. absolutely. Brad, you were always right there, man. Cordiero opens up with an anecdote about how Grant apparently backed her up on a case three years ago. Even though he doesn't necessarily remember it, this will give him the idea that Cordiero will be even more sympathetic and helpful towards him as he's done her a favor in the past. It also allows them to continue reminiscing about their time on the force and the people they've worked with, further strengthening the subconscious bond Grant will be creating. I just don't understand how we got to this point. Yeah, me neither. You're on top. Oh, I'm just ready to go to bed. I don't blame you. Me too. Me too. And if we could do that, you just talk to me. <laughs> well, I just have to, since you read those rights, I have to stay, I have to do the right. Well, what, the right. what's the difference? See, you know the difference? Regardless of something happened or not, and if it did, if it was an accident, well, tell me. Like, let me help, help me help you. Like, I want to know what I can do 
or what happened today. Today you're going to explain it later. I, I don't know what happened today. I just need to. You know, people are going to have questions. Mm -hmm. Your family. Yeah, I have questions. Well, exactly. So. So why can't we figure this out together? Cordero is making a conscious effort to use inclusive language, such as, we will figure this out together. This and her open and expressive body language are both techniques she's using to make Grant feel more relaxed, and as though he's part of the solution, not the problem. She's also making every effort to be nice to Grant, in hopes that maybe he'll finally open up to her, or at least give her a way in. We insert from the very beginning. I mean, I know you probably slept in because you work nights. I work nights. Trust me, I worked nights for almost four years. I understand how mm -hmm. that sleep schedule is. Yeah, I sleep so. So. I missed it. Did you sleep in today? Yeah. I <laughs> bet you did. You could have got to work tonight, huh? Yeah. Yeah. What time did you get up? Mm -hmm. Around noon. That's usually what time I got up, too. Did you watch anything good on TV? Usually that's what I do. I'd eat and watch TV. I woke myself up a little bit. <laughs> Anything good? Same old stuff. Oh, yeah? TV. You watch the same episodes? Or, like, do you have a specific TV show you would wake up and watch? Well, we watched, uh, I mean, my wife always has it on, uh, I can't remember what channel it's called, right now, TV Land. Oh, okay. <laughs> I haven't really watched any of that. I don't even, I couldn't even tell you what it was about. Is your wife like that? Oh, yeah, I think she's been watching other stuff. But that's <laughs> <what I'm talking laughs> that was like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It might not be about the case, but finally, Grant is talking, and Cordero has found her way in. If she can keep the flow of this conversation up, she might be slowly able to extract information from him even without him knowing. Talking about specifics such as TV shows and sleep schedules, even that could lead to catching him in a lie, and placing him in certain places at certain times. But most importantly, she's building a connection with him and continuing to let him talk, which increases the chance that he either slips up or decides to make it easier on the detectives and answer a question. But predictably, as soon as Cordero started asking him to talk about the case again, he shut down once more, refusing to answer any more questions and staying silent. I think you have a lot to live for. Beautiful family who I've had the privilege of talking to. The way I look at it, is you're a man. Men face their mistakes and they own up to them. Mm -hmm. And they figure out what happened and figure out how to solve it and move on. Like I said, I'm I'm honestly here to help you. I want you to understand that. I wouldn't spend my time in here with you if I didn't. And that something happened today that needs to be explained. Did you make a mistake today? Even after reminding him of his family, Grant doesn't move an inch, again realizing that his only chance of being let off is to not speak and hope they don't find anything. I like you, I like this fella that was a detective here, and I know they all don't care about any of that and stuff, and I just don't know how to, how to, uh, I've had this happen before, uh, being brought in and interrogated for something, so I don't. I don't care, but I just don't know how to, how to, I think how to be silent so you don't hear looking like a jerk. No, you're not. <laughs> Honestly, you are far from that. You're very polite. <laughs> don't you know why you're here? I appreciate you guys, and I'm just going to kind of get a lawyer. Yeah, it's up to you. But you can be obviously here. something's going on, and I need one. I just want to hear your side of it. I want to get along here. After hours of almost pointless back and forth, Grant finally asks for a lawyer, meaning the detectives can no longer question him, and concludes the interrogation. But this is far from where the story ends. Between this interrogation and the final court hearing, Grant and his lawyer both realized that there was simply no way he was going to be released scot-free. Not only was there a man at the scene of the crime who all but saw him pull the trigger, people were also starting to realize that he'd actually either been fired or resigned from three different police force jobs before becoming the chief of police in his hometown. So, on October 16th, 2017, he pleaded guilty 
guilty to the first degree murder, but refused to reveal his motive, leaving each member of James Appleton's family without closure to this day. However, as Grant was being prosecuted, a shocking revelation was made that turned him, a murderer, into a senseless monster of a human being. As his DNA was being taken, they realized it was already in the system, under an unknown name for a crime committed almost 20 years ago. In November of 1997, a teacher at Frank Tillery Elementary School went to the teacher's lounge bathroom only to be met by a man brandishing a gun that forced her into a stall. The man then ripped her and fled, taking care not to touch anything or leave evidence behind, except for the left on her clothes. Local police did everything they could to identify the perp, but after 20 months of effort, the investigation went cold until 20 years later when Grant Hardin's DNA was found to be a perfect match. And because Rogers police had obtained a John Doe warrant back in 2003, allowing them to arrest an unknown suspect and bypass the statute of limitations, he was hit with the 14-year sentence for his on top of the 21 years for the murder of James Appleton. And as such, Grant Hardin was sentenced to 35 years in prison, meaning that he'll likely live out the rest of his life behind bars. But Grant isn't the only example of a killer cop that almost got away with it. For an even more clear-cut example, let's take a look at William Talley's case. Is it Kelly? Yeah, right now you're charged with murder, and it is Kelly. No! On the 11th of May, 2019, police received a worrying phone call explaining that former police sergeant William Talley had been in an argument with his girlfriend, Kelly Levinson. At some point during the fight, he fired gunshots at her. William quickly left the scene, stealing Kelly's truck, but was worried he may have done more damage than he realized. So I don't know anything since then. So nobody's here has been injured. <clears throat> no, that that's what I told him when I called. He told me that he was in shelter. The police had to immediately treat this like a crime scene and decided to search the house to ensure Kelly's safety. There was one thing on the officers' minds, and they were all silently pleading that they wouldn't find her dead. Deputy Brown, who used to work with the house. There's a dog in there. Yep, she's right there. Sorry to get mad. Upon entering the house, evidence of some kind of physical altercation was scattered throughout. As they entered the kitchen, though, they would find Kelly's dead body lying on the ground. With all the evidence the police had, it wasn't difficult for them to determine their main suspect. But catching him was another matter. They knew that William had received both police and SWAT training, so he'd be difficult to catch. However, all of a sudden, police received a phone call informing them William had gotten into a car crash. The cops rushed to the hospital where they found their number one suspect waiting for them, bruised and bloodied. We're gonna take care of you now. Once William was discharged from the hospital, he was immediately brought to an interrogation room where the investigation would truly begin. Can I ask what my charges are? Yeah, right now you're charged with murder. You're charged with violation of public who? office, and you're charged who? with um, who? possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Who? who? That's what we're hoping you can tell us. Maybe once we start talking about it a little bit. Um, it wasn't back here, was it? Who was it, Kelly? Well, was it a William mentions two names here. Becky and Kelly. Of course, we know Kelly to be his girlfriend, but William was actually married to another woman named Rebecca Talley who he'd been cheating on. William obviously appears dazed and confused, but whether this is just an act or not is another question. He'd spent multiple days in the hospital and was discharged after being medically cleared, so it's unlikely he'd still be this out of it. Regardless, it at least seems to be keeping him calm. At least for now. And you can sign this. Nobody's talking with me about things. Well, we're going to get to that. That's what we're hoping to get to. No, I'm not talking until somebody talks to me. I can tell you who, if we can get started there. And it is Kelly. No! Don't do that. No! No! Tally, come on. Tally. Bill. Bill. No! No! 
There's a small chance William really is this distraught over Kelly's death, but he was completely unaware of what he was doing at the time. So it seems more likely that he's actually just using this as a guise to vent and scream about how his life is pretty much finished and over a small argument with his mistress. He's also likely frustrated that he got caught so easily. Remember, this is a man with SWAT and police training. He knows how to evade the cops, but almost instantly after going on the run, his plans were shut down in an incredibly unpredictable way. William manages to calm down while the detective talks to him, but only for a few short seconds. Stop, Bill. Relax. Bill, stop. It's all unnecessary, Bill. If you don't want to talk to us, that's fine, but let's not, let's not do this, okay? Okay? Just let's not do this. Who else to guard it? Right now, you're hurting yourself. I don't care about me. Who else to hurt? There's no one I else. I keep hearing when people whisper. Or whispers it. Okay, well, what, what, what's, what whispering do you hear? No, tell me. Tell me the truth. Okay. There's no one else hurt. Okay. What you're watching is a man who knows without a doubt that he's guilty doing everything he can to try and find a way out. He's panicking and the cops were probably extremely relieved when William finally asked for a lawyer and put an end to this dramatic interrogation. However, this obviously didn't help him at all as the detectives already had all the evidence they needed to convict him and William Talley was sentenced to life behind bars. Despite William being a local cop and even knowing some of the officers involved, this case was handled perfectly. A stark contrast to that of Matthew Boynton, whose case was so weird and corrupt that the cops ended up investigating a shooting that never even happened. You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. Why would you do that, Matthew? On the 15th of April 2016, police found Jessica Boynton hidden in the closet of her home with a gunshot wound to the head and a police-issued firearm in her hand. The county sheriff reportedly ruled her dead at the scene, but there was a problem. Jessica was neither dead nor shot. After she was rushed to the hospital, the ER found no entrance wounds or bullets. Instead, they found evidence of a blunt force attack to the back of her head. This case is already incredibly confusing, but what's worse is that the police's number one suspect, Matthew Boynton, told cops that he received a text from Jessica saying she was about to commit suicide. After rushing home, he heard two gunshots coming from the house and called the police. Matthew was taken to the police station and interrogated, but was caught lying about a vital piece of evidence. This is where we join the detectives as they try to unwrap this baffling web of lies. Do you recognize that bag? Yes, that bag that Jessica let me use to put all my gym stuff in when we used to be together. Okay, so when's the last time you saw that bag? Uh, it's been a long time. Like I said, I, when I used to work out at, um, there's two gyms in Thomaston. I don't remember the name of it. I used that one, and I had a uh, gray Nike bag I used to work out in. Um, so I interchanged my stuff like protein drinks, um, powder shakes, like pre-workout, uh, workout shorts, pants, shoes, whatever. I put it in that bag or my Nike bag. Suspects who aren't telling the truth tend to over-explain as they feel they have something to prove to detectives. If they can give lots of information over, they think it'll convince the detective that they're not lying as they couldn't possibly make all of that up. However, in actuality, suspects telling the truth will give a more instinctual, simplified answer to the question because they don't have to think about it as much. Bear that in mind as the interview continues. So when's the last time you saw that bag? I mean, it's been a while. I don't, I don't know an exact date. I don't know. I think my stepdad, he he had it in the, I think the white trailer, and that that's been a while. And he brought it, but I haven't been through it or anything. Put it in my storage thing in my house, which is like when you pull in the driveway. Mm -hmm. It's a little storage thing on the right. You open the door and it's got all my stuff in there. I declared that some of it out recently. That was tossed in there, but I mean, it's in there with a bunch of my stuff, like a brown tub I used to keep in my old patrol car with gym mm -hmm. stuff in it and work stuff. 
Remember, that answer was given in response to the question, when was the last time you saw this bag? Something that could have been answered in a single sentence. The detectives already knew that Matthew was lying about this bag, as that's the whole reason he was brought to this second interrogation. But now they're 100% sure he's hiding something, and they're about to call him out on it. All right, Matthew, I've known you a long time when y'all were in the process of moving and you moved into the house that you're at now, your residence. Did you or did you not see this bag? Yes, sir, it was in my storage room in the, in the garage. Now, why would I be holding a picture of this bag? Well, I guess because Jessica brought it into you. Why would Jessica have it if you had it at your house? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody got it from my garage and <clears throat> my shed. Who would have got that, it? Um, there's a couple of people. Okay. I don't know. All right. Exactly who. The bag was completely filled with female clothes. And this is one photo of it. That's not yours. No. This whole thing might not seem like a big deal, but it's actually the root of a much bigger problem. This bag, along with everything in it, belonged to Jessica. So when it was discovered in Matthew's possession, after he told police that he'd handed all of her belongings over, it confirmed that he had been lying under oath. Again, a small issue at first, but now that the detectives know he's comfortable lying about this, they know that almost every piece of information he's given them could be completely untrue. The bag was turned into us. We have possession of the bag. We have evidence that says it came out of your storage room. Is that true? Yes, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? No, sir. Do you believe, do you believe that statement to be accurate and true? Not now. Did you believe it then? No, sir. Matthew has now essentially confessed to stealing the bag of Jessica's belongings and lying under oath. There is the question of why he did this, but we haven't even gotten started on the assault part of the case. Why Jessica was found unconscious in their closet after allegedly texting Matthew she was going to shoot herself. As it turns out though, the police would also never move on to that part of the case, and it remained completely unanswered. Matthew was charged with stealing and lying under oath, and after being placed on administrative leave, he resigned from the force, but went completely uncharged for whatever happened on the night of April 15th. Many people have been left wondering why that may be, but the most obvious answer lies in police corruption, and the fact that the county sheriff just so happened to be Matthew's granddad, the same sheriff who lied by pronouncing Jessica dead at the scene. What's worse is that Jessica's head trauma left her without any memory of that night, so it's likely this case will remain unsolved forever. But people thought the same about the murder of Sherry Rasmussen, which lay unsolved for 23 years, before new information revealed that the culprit was actually one of the police force's best detectives. Now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? After decades of investigations, DNA evidence revealed that Stephanie was very likely the culprit of a murder committed in 1986. Because of the high stakes nature of the case, the detectives made sure to meticulously plan this interrogation. Stephanie was a really successful detective herself, and she had recently received records recommendations for her good work on a theft case. So the detectives used this and brought her in under the guise that they needed help with a case. I don't want to talk about this in the squad room because okay. I, I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's yeah. always wondering what everybody oh, else yeah, is sure, doing. No okay. An interrogation room is a strange place for such a conversation to take place, so to put her mind at ease, detectives told her this was the place they'd least be likely to be overheard, as the case details were strictly confidential. Sherry Rasmussen's body had been found at her home after being shot three times. At the time, police suspected the murder was a result of a burglary gone wrong, but the case went cold when they couldn't identify the suspect. However, 23 years later, when revisiting the case, detectives found evidence that led them towards Stephanie, a girl who had been trapped in a love triangle with Sherry and her husband, John Rutten. So the detectives decided to bring up John's name to see how she'd react. Are you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. I mean, yeah. I mean what's this all about? It's a case we're working on, and it involves John, and in there, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, we good friends. Um lived in the dorms for i lived in the dorms for two years was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys yeah i mean we dated uh, uh -huh. you know um i mean 
Is, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Both the detectives and Stephanie have tried to seem as friendly and relaxed as possible around each other, but Stephanie is obviously starting to get very anxious at this point. Even though the detectives gave a somewhat believable excuse, she is now in an interrogation room faced by two detectives being questioned about a girl she supposedly murdered 20 years earlier. Her breathing has become faster, and her language is defensive, and her movements have become more erratic. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay? So, you know, if you're, if you're doing this as an interrogation, you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with, you know, now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe, because <laughs> now, 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 yeah, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Stephanie chooses to provide DNA evidence, hoping her willingness to help out would ultimately prove her innocence. But unfortunately for her, just five minutes later, the detectives decide they've heard enough and put her in cuffs. Months later, after a long and arduous trial, a decision was made by the jury. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stephanie Eileen Lazarus, guilty of the crime of murder of Sherry Rasmussen. We further find the murder was of the first degree. After hiding it for 23 years, Stephanie Lazarus was finally found guilty of murder and sentenced to 27 years behind bars. Sometimes though, it's not this easy to get a story straight and catch a cop out in a lie. In this case, the officers had to decide on the spot where to arrest a fellow cop for murder or let him walk free. I think I murdered him that night. At 1 a.m. on the 28th of July, police were called by a taxi driver after a man started banging on his window, begging him to call the cops. The man, later identified as Ohio Police Chief Chad McCardle, claimed he was stabbed by a group of people, but when cops arrived, his story changed drastically. Three guys called me the car and pulled me up. And they drove me south. Where'd they stab you? Right here, he hit me probably three or four times. I just and then he got me right here. Do you have any idea who it is? Dude, you're in Spanish. a car? They pulled me in the car. They pulled you into the car. Here's, here's what the up, dude. I'm a cop. I don't know what your guys' problem is, but... Okay. For some reason, Chad decided to start being slightly passive-aggressive to the cops, despite them not having any problem with him whatsoever. It's clear that something might be bothering Chad, and it's obviously not the four stab wounds that he claims to have sustained. Luckily, it doesn't take long for him to spell the truth. Basically, this finale, it sort of keeps me in the face. I, I grab a stick and start stabbing <laughs> I'm pretty sure I killed one of them. You think you killed one of them? Yeah. He like came up, kicked in the face. I was like, all right, let's go. I broke the branch off and started just stabbing. I don't want dude to be dead, but don't f around with me, dude. What started out as a simple call has suddenly turned into something incredibly serious that's going to be pretty hard to solve. As it stands, their only witness is also their primary suspect, but they've also got a gang of people and a dead body to find. This one isn't going to be easy, or at least that was the case until they found this in the alley where it all happened. Did you come out here? What's your name? Joey. Joey, did you hear any commotion going on? Like a fight or something that's broke out? Yeah. Come out here for me, so I can see you. I was just hiding from him. You were hiding from him? Yeah. So what did you hear? I was standing right there, and he kicked me in the back out of the blue. Kicked you? Yeah. Did you do anything to him when he kicked you? No. No? I, I hit the ground. Matter of fact, my back is bruised. So when he came up and attacked you, did he say anything? He said, I'm gonna kill you. At this point, things aren't looking good for Chad. On the bright side, nobody's dead, so he might just be able to dodge a murder charge. But by all accounts, he has still just beaten up a homeless guy for no obvious reason. So now it's up to the cops to decide what to do. I can't give any description of all these people. It says he stabbed him multiple times. There's absolutely zero stab wounds on him whatsoever. All we can corroborate is that he beat this poor guy up in an alley for no reason. Right. Who wants to press charges? Put your hands on your back. We're going to detain you right now. Cool. We'll another investigation. 
Am I being charged with something? Well, right now you are, you are detained. I think I murdered a guy at night. It seems all his years of police work haven't taught him to remain silent, as at this rate, he might end up talking himself back into a murder charge. Currently, Chad is being charged with one count of misdemeanor battery and has been placed on paid administrative leave from his position back in Ohio. The maximum charge he's facing is one year in jail and a $1,000 fine. But at least McArdle remained calm and let the officers do what they had to do. Corporal Burtzik, though, was a different matter, and his position as a superior resulted in a massive conflict of interest. Reached out for my lighter, slammed into his ass. Cool. No. Not really. Not really. No. Are you okay? Oh yeah, no, I'm good. Your car sucked up. No, absolutely. Which I just fucking fixed. Obviously, Brooke and Scott are familiar with each other, and curiously, Scott holds nothing back when describing exactly how the incident went down. It's clear that Scott is the one at fault here, so before going any further, Brooke decides to call back to the base to ask whether or not it's okay for her to be handling this incident. This crash, um, birdie, so come work it. Okay. I can't remember. It's been a long time since I've worked a crash with one of us in it, so. No, he's not on duty. He's in his POV. I just didn't want there to be any, like, conflict of interest type issues. All right. That was it. I just want to make sure. Okay, right, bye. Damn it, birdie. Brooke is given the go-ahead and told that there should be no issues with her handling this case, but that was before she noticed this. You good? Uh, wait. Huh? Wait on his way. He's not coming. Black good? Walking home, but yep, I'm good. So, Birdie, you, you giving me some indicators? Oh. Listen, listen. Shit, woman. Listen, <laughs> Valdez is coming out just to... I, I'm not going to lie to you about it. She's on her way? Yeah, she's on her way. I'm not really comfortable with this whole thing at all. But I'm not gonna lie to you about it. Oh no, I, I don't mean to put you in that indie. Yep. From now on, you know how it goes. You can't consume anything, okay? Because right now you, you're being detained. Wait, what? It's obvious that Scott is under the influence of something. Judging by his slurred speech, slowed reactions, and slight loss of motor control, Brooke is fairly sure he's been drinking. At this point, Scott is no longer her supervisor. He's just a suspect in a case, and what's more, he's drunk and likely unpredictable, a combination which can be incredibly threatening to a female officer. Please don't make my life difficult. I would never do that to you. Okay, I, I'm very uncomfortable right now. And, and I apologize for putting you in that position. Are you on? Yes, yes I am. And I'm going to remain on for uh, integrity. You know you can't smoke right now. What? Because if I'm going to do a DUI investigation, it impedes it so you can't consume anything. That is a really cute dog. Fear aggression issue. You can always train a dog. You can't consume anything. You're killing me. Trying. It's too late now. After a short wait, another officer arrives at the scene, meaning they can finally start getting to the bottom of all of this with some sobriety tests. These lasted over 10 minutes, but it's not hard to tell how they went by just looking at a few seconds of them. You may begin the test. One, two, three. Judging by this and the overwhelming amounts of evidence against him at this point, the officers thought it was safe to conclude that Scott had been drinking that night and decided it was time to put him in cuffs something he was far from happy about. There's things that we can do to fix this, but... It's got the hinge locks. Okay. Sure. Yeah. 
Despite Scott being one of the most polite and respectful suspects ever on this channel, he was actually hit with a better sentence than the majority of criminal cops. After blowing a .156 back at the station, he was charged with driving under the influence and damaging property. He was ordered to pay just under $1,000 in fines, serve 50 hours of community service, and take multiple substance abuse and DUI classes, and had his driver's license suspended for six months. He was also sued by the driver of the vehicle he hit, and a cash settlement was reached. And on top of all of that, he also was suspended without pay for a week and given a last chance agreement, meaning one more slip up and he was out for good. Realistically, this is how it should have been handled. And the Gainesville Police Department should be praised for this in the same way as the officer in charge of this case in Oklahoma. Stay in your vehicle. Back in your car. I'm drunk? No, I'm the captain. Huh? A what? Captain. A what? The big don't reach in your pocket. Get back in your car. I have a seat. I, I will. I'm not. You been drinking tonight? I just got a ride. You been drinking tonight, sir? I'm a captain on the police department. What police department? Oklahoma City. What division? Investigations. How much we had to drink tonight, sir? Please. Huh? I'm not turning my camera off. Okay. This guy isn't just drunk. He's absolutely hammered, even to the point where he thinks the camera can't hear him whispering. But despite the captain's pleas, the officer refuses to turn off his camera and continues with the investigation. Go ahead and step out of the vehicle. You gotta be kidding me. How much we drink tonight, sir? I was at a poker game. Uh huh. Because you're swerving all over me when you turn off or you didn't use your signal. I'm sorry. How much you drink at your poker game? Not much. Not much? Mm -hmm. How much is not much? I don't know. Beer? Liquor? Yeah. How Beer. many beers? Three or four. Three or four? How long ago was that? It's been going on a while. How long ago did you drink your last beer, sir? What time is it now? It's 0140. Midnight. You think you should drive it? No, but I came from four blocks. Your mom, your mom lives here. I live here. You live here? Yes. Come over to the rear of your vehicle. Okay. You got any weapons or anything on you? I do not, sir. Those must have been a strong few beers, as not only was he stumbling over his words, but apparently also swerving across both lanes on his way home. The captain is then searched and told to stand in the open where he's tested on his balance and sobriety. Hands down by your side, please. Look straight ahead. You see the tip of my pen, sir? I do. I want you to follow the tip of my pen without moving your head, okay? Come over here where it's a little bit more level. I'm going to demonstrate for you first. While I'm demonstrating, I want you to stand with your feet together, hands down by your side, just like this. All right, sir. What's your name? Matt French. Matt French. Mr. French, stand just like that for me. When I tell you to begin, okay, I'm just going to demonstrate for you first. I want you to pick a foot of your choosing. It doesn't matter if it's your left or your right foot. I'm from here. And I want you to lift it approximately six inches off the ground. And while you look at your toe, I want you to count by 1,000s, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005, so on and so forth until I tell you to stop. At any point in time, you lose your balance, your foot touches the ground. Just go ahead and pick your foot back up and continue the count, okay? Do you understand these instructions I've explained to you, I Mr. Did. French? You may begin. 1,000. Keep going. Can turn that off? I cannot, sir. Please. I know you're aware of our body cam policy. You know I cannot turn I, off this body I cam. I do, but I'd like to talk to you. I can't mm -hmm. do that, sir. Please. Are you going to do the test or not? Will you please talk to me? I'll talk you, to you once we're done. You can done. turn it off. You can turn it on. I can turn it off once I'm done with my investigation, sir. Okay. I'm a captain on this police department. I understand that, sir. I get And that. I am a sergeant on this police officer, and I I've taken not, an oath to uphold the law. 
I, I don't not, show favoritism to anyone regardless. I don't I, care if you're a gangbanger or the President of the United States. Sir, I'm not asking you for that. If I was to treat you differently than I was to treat like some South Side Loco or some pedo, how's that look on me? Okay, I'm not asking you for that. Because I wouldn't do that for any of them. Even as the captain begs him to turn his camera off and just talk, the officer stands his ground and states that he has to treat everyone the same or his job and livelihood could be at risk. He's showing a fantastic amount of integrity that unfortunately we don't get to see too often, likely due to people like this trying to pull rank. They then continue with the third and final test, involving simply walking heel to toe for 10 steps. All right, anytime you're ready, you may begin. One, two, three. Go ahead and turn around for me and put your hands behind your back. Are you going to arrest me, sir? Yes, I am. Can I talk to you? Go ahead and put your hands behind your back, sir. Now that the investigation is concluded and the purpose placed under arrest, the officer turns off his camera and returns the captain to the police department. Not only was he suspended from his position as Oklahoma police captain, but he was also hit with the regular punishments for DUI, likely amounting to a small fine and a few months in jail. Bad cops ruin lives, so it's extra satisfying to see one taken down by another cop. On January 14th, 2021, a resident of Harnett County, North Carolina reported her dirt bike as stolen. What followed was a series of events that led to an innocent 14-year-old being treated like a dirty criminal. Okay, do me a favor, man. Go ahead and put your hands on your back for me, okay? 16 days after the dirt bike was reported missing, it appeared on Facebook Marketplace. And when the owner saw this, they set up a meeting with the seller in order to catch them out. When they arrived, they were met by 14-year-old Malcolm, who did indeed have their dirt bike. They agreed to a deal and told Malcolm that they were headed out to an ATM machine to get the cash out, when in fact, they were calling 911. The problem here was Malcolm was completely innocent and had bought the dirt bike off the true criminal in good faith without realizing it was stolen. He had made a hobby of fixing up bikes and selling them on, an impressive hustle for one so young. So you can imagine his surprise when instead of finding himself in profit, he found himself in handcuffs. Okay, what's your name? Malcolm. Malcolm? Yes. I what's, Malcolm. what's your last name, Malcolm Ziegler? Yeah. Okay, you got your ID on you? No, I do not. Okay. But that wasn't us right. We haven't run at all this week. Where, where do y'all, where do you stay? You stay here? Yeah. Okay, okay. I haven't run at all today. He could have just came by here. Who's that guy? Who's that guy running down the street? That's his friend. They, okay. They say somewhere up there. Okay. Give me a favor, man. Go ahead and put your hands on your back for me, okay? What? Yep. Right You're in possession of a stolen motor vehicle. What? What? Diggs, you want to go and verify that for me? Yeah. What? Do me a favor, man. Just um, come to my car right over here, okay? What the? Can I get the bill of sale and show you that I bought it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll get all that taken care of, man. But what I what I need to do is just hang tight for me right here, okay? The officer places him under arrest without verifying any of the facts. He had no way of knowing if Malcolm was, in fact, in possession of stolen goods and spent no time attempting to hear his side of the story. Well, I'm going to work on getting you out of there soon, okay? Just keep cooperating with me. I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll get everything squared away. Stole before. I don't, okay. I mean, and, and sir, I'm trying to find this bill of sale. I have sir, a lot of and, it. and I'm not saying that you stole it. Right now, what we've got is we just got a stolen motor vehicle. Um, we're not saying that you stole the vehicle. Okay, I'm not saying that at all. Okay. Yes, sir. But it, it still is a crime to be in possession of a stolen motor vehicle. The officer claims it is illegal to be in possession of a stolen vehicle, which may be true in most cases, but not here. If a suspect willingly buys or owns an item that they know is stolen, then that is a crime. But since Malcolm was ignorant to this fact, he was totally innocent, and this arrest could prove to be extremely unlawful. And I can and tell you, I can show you, if you can go on, I can, you can go on my phone, I can show you exactly what I bought Okay, from. okay. We met at the Lillington Presbyterian Church. Okay. If you know what that is. Okay. Lillington Presbyterian Church. Well, your dad's coming over here right now. It was about 8.30 when we met. Hey, how are you doing, sir? Hey, um. Dad, I need that so, bill of sale. Reason all this is going down, um, that vehicle's been entered a stolen International Crime Information Center. 
Do you have the bill of sale by any chance, sir? I, 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 don't, I don't know where it is. It's either in my room or in the garage. You gotta tell me where it is, my As Malcolm's father tries to find proof his son bought the bike legally, two other responding officers begin to voice their concerns over what is happening in front of their very eyes. Is he, is he detained or 1095? From what I heard, 1095. And that was before I even verified the van. Okay. But that's why, well, my first thing I asked. That's that's what I okay. now I'm not 100 percent certain, but I believe I heard 10 I heard essentially 295 before I was even able to verify the van. Eventually, one of them decides to intervene. Hey, he's so, detained, or is he he's detained right now because he is. He did he's not. 14. He's 14. Yes. Okay. So I already explained to him he's detained right now. I told him that. So why is he detained? Because that's a stolen under vehicle. Okay. So, I mean, Diggs verified the VIN number, right? Did you, is that before all that, that you verified before you? I, I detained him and then okay, we that's verified. that's why I asked if he was 1095 or detained. He's detained. Okay. So, obviously he's a juvenile, right? Yeah. Ain't no sense having him sit in the car 10 with handcuffs on. Where, okay. You ain't, if he was 18 and you might be taken to jail for mm -hmm. possession of stolen property, right. different. But we ain't, you ain't gonna take him to jail, right? It's gonna be a petition. Mm -hmm. The officer clearly knows what he's talking about when he explains the difference between detaining an adult and a child. And after urging his fellow officer to reconsider his position, the arresting cop finally comes to his senses. After finally being released, Malcolm found the receipt for the dirt bike and no further action was taken. But his family later released a press conference where they asked for police reform in the wake of another juvenile suffering mistreatment at the hands of law enforcement. But at least that cop was able to keep his hands to himself and didn't resort to violence. A far cry from the actions of this extremely aggressive sergeant. No, don't touch me again. Sir. Get the Sergeant Police had been with the Sunrise Police for 20 years and was about as experienced an officer as you could get, which makes his actions during an arrest in November 2021 even more confusing. When he arrived on the scene, he found his fellow cops in the middle of a struggle. Get Just in the get car. In the car. All right, I'm getting in. Get your feet in. The suspect had been arrested on Sunset Strip after being accused of punching another man, and officers are trying to get him inside the patrol car. But the suspect isn't playing ball. So Sergeant Police decides his 20 years of experience is enough to allow him to push other officers aside and take charge. Hey, 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 look at me. Look at me. Look at me. You want to play games? You're playing with the wrong mother. You gotta do, man. You gonna mace me, mace me. Look at me, mother. The suspect decides to comply when the extremely aggressive officer steps in. And you'd think that'd be where the story ends. But for some reason, police just gets angrier and angrier until one noble cop decides that they just can't stand by and watch any longer. Sir, you ever get disrespectful sir, my you officers, I will remove your soul from your body. Do what you gotta do. Police had to have been having a horrible day, as it was his threats to remove the suspect's soul from his body that prompted the young female officer to pull him back. This clearly angered him even further, leading to him grabbing her by the neck. This was not only illegal and a huge overreaction, but it was also terrifying for the rookie on the receiving end. We clear? Yes, sir. And I'll f see you in about five minutes. Can you stop pulling the hands up from my wrist? Hold it and fix like an alarm. No, I'm like I'm running somewhere. I'm right here. Police was eventually charged with felony battery of a police officer, which comes with a heavy punishment. Predictably, he decided to retire from the Sunrise Police in November 2022, and as of this video's upload, his case is still ongoing. But now, it's time to look at the most disgusting corrupt cop of all. An officer so horrible, he managed to accrue 20 felonies, all for crimes against children. Can I ask this? This is something I might, I should have lawyers on. In April 2020, San Diego police received tips that a man had been engaging in with a local child. Two months of investigation led directly to Jalen and the mountain of questions that desperately needed answering. So I know that I 
have a lot to delve into, but I, I really want to get to know you first, if you don't yeah, mind. Definitely. Okay. So I'm going to lean back and get comfortable. Um, just because, are you comfortable? Do you want to yeah, take off I'm your good. duty belt? No, I'm good. I'm okay. Good. Can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? Yeah, so I will ask what this is about. Yeah, so we're looking into some allegations that were made. We're kind of, it, it started with a Crime Stopper report, so we're just kind of okay. going from there. Um, uh, we did receive um, a picture um, that, um, you know, when we looked into it, it looks similar to you. So I don't know yeah. if you can take a look at the picture and just tell me if you've seen this picture before. Oh, I have like 15 million things here. Okay. As soon as the allegations are brought up, Jalen becomes visibly stressed. He leans forward tentatively in his chair, clasps his hands together softly, and clenches his jaw. It's obvious he's worried about whatever he's about to be shown. The detectives have made it clear that he is not currently being detained and is free to leave at any time. However, she is making a noticeable effort to make him feel relaxed, using a bubbly and friendly persona to put him at ease. So this picture right here. Yeah, that's definitely me. I'm the gross one. Okay, so um, this picture right here. How old were you when it was taken? Uh, I don't know, 20. 20? Okay, cool. That makes it very easy. Um, so, as far as like um, the picture, so um, this photo came up in connection with some allegations um, about you communicating with a younger female on Snapchat. Okay. Can I ask, is this something I might, I should have lawyers on? Jalen is starting to seem more and more stressed. He begins to sway in his chair more and becomes more closed off with his answers. But the pressure he's feeling now is nothing compared to what the detective is about to lay on him. Um, so, you know, this, like I said, this photo was um, sent to this person, so they were in possession of it. And we can't find any connection or reason why this photo would end up with this particular person if it wasn't shared by someone you may know or yourself. I agree, yeah. I, my wife would have done it, so I don't know why she would share that. So. Well, along with the photo came some additional information about your personal life. Okay. Um, and based on some of the information you shared with me today, it seems to add up. Okay. The account that shared the photo and the information was called J178211, a seemingly random selection of numbers, until you realize that 17 was his college baseball jersey number, 82 was his high school jersey number, and 2011 was the year he graduated in. If this account was operated by a so-called enemy of J, they'd sure done their research. J, I'll be very honest, I just, I want to know the truth. Yeah, no, I never even heard of that account. Okay. Have you ever shared any images of your p with anyone? Yeah. Okay. And how many times would you say you've done that? A lot. Did you ever share any videos of you having p with anyone? With anyone? No. I've always had personal videos of me in my life. I was hit. And my ex actually had one, Jalen then rightly decides that he's already answered enough of the detective's questions and asks him for a lawyer. However, unfortunately for him, he's quickly handed a search warrant, allowing the police to seize DNA, his phone, and his car. Police used this to gather a mountain of evidence against Jalen and, just a few weeks later, turned himself in. Jalen was charged with 20 felonies, including engaging in lewd acts with children under the age of 14 pandering children under 16, and engaging in the child under the age of 16. A few months later, he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. But this disturbing act doesn't even compare to the atrocities that Daniel Holtzclaw committed. Daniel was brought in for interrogation after a report came in that he'd made an unlawful traffic stop and forced the female driver to remove her clothing and perform on him. What detectives didn't know was that this was just one of dozens of other crimes that Daniel would find himself accused of. So we have no misunderstanding because, and maybe I didn't key in on some things, I want you to, you turn in your activity card, walk me through it all again. Turn my activity card, I leave out station, turn off my computer, I'm done for the night, head left, go westbound on 50th okay. from Prospect. About block down, I see a Grand Grand Prix in the outside lane. I was on the inside lane, directly in front of me. Car swerved at that time. I kind of fall behind of it. Lincoln, I didn't want to light it up at the, at the stop sign, so I waited until it go forward. Just lit it up just to the west. 
And then that's when I made a traffic stop. Daniel recounts his version of events from that night. Cops said that he didn't report on the stop dispatch, run a records check on the driver, or even let them know that he just logged off for the night. But Daniel just explains that everything happened so fast he just forgot to do all of that and made the traffic stop off the grid. However, Daniel doesn't seem 100% sure while recounting this evening. He takes unusually long breaks between statements and speaks in incomplete sentences. The true reality of cases is that it's almost usually impossible to get a conviction as long as there was no video or photo evidence of the event. The victim barely ever has any ability to prove that the suspect did what they did, as in most places, they are innocent until proven guilty. This is likely why this turned out to be one of 36 charges eventually brought against Daniel, each more disgusting than the last. CSI is processing your car right now. Right. And when we stepped out, they found some pubic hairs right in here. Could they be yours? No, that's not, I didn't pull my, I didn't do anything right there. Did she? No. But she do you think they could be? No, it's not. No. Nothing of mine. Your pubes couldn't be? No. Right there? No. You seem a little extra worried whenever you're talking about seeing her boobies. Mm -hmm. You sure she just didn't flash you? I can't. She did not flash. I, I don't want to say I can't recall, but I'm pretty positive she didn't flash. Well, I see her. a pair of titties. She got, I'm she see went like this, but nothing as far as I'm going like crazy looking. Lift it, lifting the shirt. Um, no, this whole situation and uh, it's just it's kind of scary. It I is get, scary, and I don't like. I don't want my rep to be. Everything's about in law enforcement. I'm three years on. I know that, but everything's about your rep. Absolutely. And I don't want this to fall on my rep. Unfortunately for Daniel, though, this absolutely would affect his rep, as the DNA tests on the hair found in the car came back as a perfect match, and statements given by his girlfriend directly contradicted his story. So after the interrogation, he was placed on administrative leave, but just two months later, 12 more women came forward with claims, and he was subsequently arrested. Verdict, count once, battery. Defendant is guilty of the crime as battery and set punishment at eight years. Count two, procuring lewd exhibition. Not guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition. Count three, burglary in the first degree. Defendant is not guilty of the crime of burglary in the first degree, nor lesser included. Count four, procuring lewd exhibition. Defendant is guilty of the crime of procuring lewd exhibition and punishment is set at five years. Daniel was found guilty on 18 of the 36 charges and sentenced to 263 years in prison without the possibility of parole. If you enjoy true crime videos like this, make sure you're subscribed to see more.